and welcome to week four of an introduction to the archaeology of architecture. This week we're going to be looking at our second case study, the Parthenon in the city of Athens. It's one of my favorite buildings, so I'm very excited to talk about it with you. Let's hop right into it. So in terms of learning objectives, just like last week, I want to introduce the geographical context of the Parthenon, uh, both within the Mediterranean as a whole, as well as in Athens itself. In terms of historical context, the approach is going to be slightly different than last week, but we're going to get into that. And then lastly, we're going to look at the building itself, interpreting it, and we're going to discuss the three Fs in correlation with the palimpsest. So taking bits from all of the concepts we talked about in week two. And in terms of questions this week, again, what defines architecture? This is something I want you to be thinking about as we work through this course. And another harken back. Uh, to a question I asked you in week two. Does everything that happened, you know, to a building and within a building, like within its context, is that all important? You know, are all the phases of a building important? And, you know, what kind of historical context maybe might make one phase obsolete within that palimpsest? So again, just something I want you to be thinking about as we go through the uh, material regarding the Parthenon today. And then Obviously, uh, is removal or losing a phase to reveal an earlier phase part of the palimpsest? So, you know, does a removal of a phase count as its own phase? Again, something I want you thinking about as we uh, start to go through the material here. So geographically, the Parthenon is located in the city of Athens, Greece. Uh, Athens itself has been a major urban center for well over 3,000 years. It's located on the eastern side of a peninsula in the southern part of the country, or the modern country of Greece, uh, on the Aegean Sea, which is that uh, sea that's bordered by Greece and Turkey. They're kind of an offshoot of the Mediterranean. And the area around Athens has a very long history, and the area itself has been continuously occupied since the Neolithic period, uh, obviously primarily due to its location with protection from the peninsula and the Bay of Salamis to the west. So it's a key strategic point in the Aegean and really the overall Mediterranean. So this put Athens at the center of the ancient world, especially prior to the rise of Rome and its empire. Uh, so Athens was one of many city-states or polis that made up uh, the area that is now modern Greece at this time. Uh, and other notable ones include Thebes and Sparta. And these were all independent city-states, and they had their own laws and customs and obviously frequently quarreled with each other, but this is going to come into play when we discuss the construction of the Parthenon in a minute here. So within Athens itself, the Parthenon was built on a prominent geological feature called the Acropolis, uh, which in a literal sense means summit city, which is a very appropriate name uh, given that it rises nearly 100 meters above the city, and you can see all the way to the sea. And it had been, you know, a prominent cultic and religious center in Athens prior to the construction of the Parthenon, as well as, you know, after the construction of the Parthenon. It's a very strategic point, uh, just like, you know, Athens is in general, but the Acropolis itself offers protection, and it also offers a great, you know, pedestal on which to build prominent buildings that you want people to look at every day, if not multiple times a day. So this begs the question, is the Acropolis more than a context for the Parthenon? Is it part of its architecture? And again, we kind of discussed that idea of think about the wider context in which something was built, but I also want you to think about how, you know, natural features are used as part of a structure, not just as a place to build a structure. Again, just <laughs> one of those things with archeology span and architecture that I want you to think about as we move forward here. So the Parthenon has a very different history in comparison to the Gigantia temple that we looked at uh, in our first case study. But in a similar approach, I do want to discuss its construction and the historical context behind that. I think it's very important to understand the foundational intentions for a building especially when applying the three Fs and discussing this idea of the palimpsest in architecture. So construction of the Parthenon began in about 447 BCE. And 
a couple decades prior to this had seen the destruction of the Athenian Acropolis and all the temples that existed prior to this program uh, by the Persians during their invasion 480 BCE under Xerxes. And this led to the formation of the Delian League. Now, what's important to understand about the Delian League is that it was a unification of all those independent Greek poles, all those city-states. And this was all under, for lack of a better word, Athens. And with the money that Athens collected from the Delian League between the invasion and the construction of the Parthenon, Athens put a lot of that towards rebuilding her Acropolis. And so the Parthenon was at the center of that new building program. It was a very large, very uniquely styled temple, and it was placed at the highest point in the city. And, you know, despite having a lot of sort of generic iconography in its art, such as Panhellenism, which is all Greeks, so a unified Greece, and this idea of, you know, order Greeks versus barbarism, Persians, it was built as a temple to Athena Parthenos, which is an epithet of the patron goddess of Athens, Athena. So is it really a celebration of all of Greece or just a celebration of Athens? Now the Delian League, surprisingly, did not last. <laughs> and eventually the city-states were at war again before the end of the 5th century BCE. But this, I think, inherently is part of what the Parthenon was meant to represent at the time it was constructed. Uh, so, you know, its architecture was sort of this grand gesture of reinforcing this idea of, you know, hope in your citizens and celebration and victory, while also, you know, reinforcing the idea of power and wealth, um, all to worship, you know, your patron god or your patron goddess, but inherently you are celebrating your city at its core. That is, you know, the main idea behind the Parthenon. Despite all, you can say all you want about the iconography, but it was about Athens. It wasn't about, you know, a unified Greece, I think, at that point. So I've touched on feelings, uh, feeling a bit, you know, that one F of our three. But, you know, in terms of form and function, let's get into that a little bit. So in terms of, you know, generic architectural style, the Parthenon is classified within what is known as the Doric order. Uh, this is both in layout, but primarily in its column style. However, within its own context and in comparison to contemporary temples at the time, the Parthenon was much larger than most other Doric temples. Uh, for example, it had eight columns across its facade, other than the uh, usual six. Uh, and it also incorporated elements from the Ionic Order, which was a completely separate temple order at the time. And I just want to use these examples to kind of emphasize, again, going off of feeling, using form, that this was a very unique building, even within its own time, and it was a building that was made to stand out. And going off of that statement as well, I want to emphasize that most, if not all, ancient temples were once painted with very vibrant colors. And this includes the Parthenon. You can see this lovely reconstruction here. And this kind of introduces this idea of, you know, a, going down to the individual. Do the colors, you know, instill a different kind of feeling in you than, say, a monochrome building would? I personally find the colors to be, you know, they have the sense of vibrancy, celebration. Uh, and, you know, you can see the art better, so it kind of, you know more eye-catching iconography, but it's less imposing, I find, than, you know, just a monochrome, like, all-marble building, which tends to be the way a lot of media will portray temples like this. Not all media, I will say there are a couple that get it right. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just something to think about when you look at all these ruins, all these large temples. A lot of them were probably painted vibrantly, and that goes for statues and everything as well. And so, you know, that changes our own perception of the building, or that's one aspect that can, but uh, you have to take all these kind of, these factors into account when you discuss form, but also especially when you discuss function. So unlike last week, I'm going to approach the further historical context of the Parthenon slightly differently, 
And that's mainly because we know more about this building. We know more about, we have more information about its history. And so I thought a good way to kind of summarize this and approach this idea of archaeology and architecture was to give you sort of a very quick timeline of some of the notable events in regards to function. Honestly, I could probably give you an entire course on this building alone, but for the sake of simplicity, this is how I'm going to approach this aspect of interpreting the Parthenon. So as you can see by this small timeline here, the function of the building changed over time, but its core structure, so that core structure of that initial pagan temple did exist, but within all of these different contexts and possibly with, you know, additional um, features added on over time, depending on what it was used for. So first notable um, event <laughs> uh, that of the Parthenon was that in around the 6th century BCE, it was converted into a Christian church. And notably, it saw different forms of Christianity. So it was subject to, you know, early Roman Catholicism, followed by uh, Greek Orthodoxy in the Middle Ages. Uh, and then following the Ottoman invasion in 1456 under Mehmed II, it was converted into a mosque. And likely, as well, the Ottomans probably built their own mosque um, at one point on the Acropolis and allowed the Greek Orthodox uh, citizens to continue using that to worship as they were fairly tolerant of other religions uh, during the course of their invasion. But there, it's kind of sketchy on the sources there. We don't know for sure if that is exactly what happened or if, you know, the Parthenon itself was converted into a mosque for a time. But one notable event I think that's rather interesting in the Parthenon's history. So, you know, it's been a this place of worship, this on this epic, you know, geological feature. And in 1687, while at war with the Venetians, the Ottomans used the Parthenon as a place to store gunpowder. So a gunpowder magazine. Uh, one of its many functions over time. And sadly, a uh, stray cannonball found that gunpowder and it exploded, <laughs> uh, creating, you know, pretty much the entire interior of it to just collapse. It was completely destroyed. I think it was only the two end facades, really, that still stood after that. And following that, actually, the Ottomans built another mosque, as you can see um, in that other uh, illustration there. Uh, they built another mosque kind of in between those two facades, so still incorporating, you know, that pagan temple into their relig like religious structures, their later religious structures, but, you know, was it decoration? Did it serve some other purpose? Again, just it continued to be a part of the building programs, even though it was no more than a crumbling ruin at that point. Uh, but following Greece's uh, independence in 1832, um, a lot of those Ottoman structures were completely removed from the Acropolis, and that harkens back to that question I asked you at the beginning of the lecture. Is a removal part of a palimpsest, or is it just a purely destructive act that shouldn't be considered, and it's, you know, something that ruined part of the palimpsest? Again, it's just something I want you to think about um, as we get into our discussion here. So... Obviously, the Parthenon has a very long history since its initial construction. Uh, so my question I want to posit to you is, is the Parthenon all of these things? Is the Parthenon a pagan temple? Is it a Christian church? Is it a mosque? Is it a gun magazine? Is it a decoration? Architecturally, is it all of those things? Or is it just a temple that was, you know, used for something else? You know, and since Greek independence was established in 1832, the Parthenon has been reconstructed to reflect that most original form. Um, mostly, again, a lot of other structures in Greece were kind of acted as the symbol for an independent Greece, for this country that kind of came into its own. And it became obviously a focal point of tourism, which is a very important part of the Greek economy. But going off of that, is this a problematic way to approach a building? You know, is do you think it's problematic that erasing pieces of something's history, you know, is that bad? 
in terms of the overall palimpsest or is what it is now just part of its palimpsest? Because we do, under, we do understand the history. We have plenty of accounts and we understand how, you know, the Parthenon changed over time. But, you know, taking its original form, making it what it is, is that problematic? I'm asking you a lot of questions because this is how, again, I want you to be thinking about this material. But of course, you know, this is where the three Fs come into play. So we know its form practically inside and out. Uh, we know that it had various functions over time, but again, going back to this idea of the palimpsest, the Parthenon you see today, and quite frankly, a good chunk of the Acropolis in general, is a reconstruction of that first phase from the fifth century BCE. So, you know, why is that? Like, why would someone be more interested in that than they would in, you know, say the Christian phase or the Ottoman phase or the gunpowder magazine phase? You know, and this is not even to mention that there are pieces of the Parthenon scattered, you know, all over the world as well. So, again, I want you thinking about the three Fs. Think about form. For the most part, the form didn't change because the structure was fairly sound, you know, in a practical sense. But its function changed multiple times. So in turn, did that affect the form? You know, when it became a Christian church, was that its form or was that just its function? So inherently, I think the feeling that the Parthenon invoked from its initial construction has never changed. But that's my just per my personal opinion, you know. What it was meant to emulate hasn't changed, but going off of that, it was used as a gun magazine. It was used as a simple place to store something. Was that just kind of, you know, a practice, like a matter of convenience in a time of war? I mean, they really, the Acropolis, they could have put the gunpowder anywhere, but they put it in the Parthenon, you know, just again, something to think about. And think about feeling too. So even when you know, the Parthenon switched from being pagan to Christian. Were those responsible, um, like, for that conversion? Were they still trying to invoke, you know, that idea of awe, grandeur, power, dominance, celebration, uh, especially that all the vibrant colors would have, you know, invoked in, like, were they trying to take that, but take it on, like, take on a new meaning in a new context? So, you know, the art didn't change, but its meaning, the way it was interpreted by those individuals who, you know, weren't pagans anymore, they were Christians, you have to think that, yes, the way they felt about the architecture would have changed in comparison to, you know, someone celebrating, like, some sort of pagan festival would have approached the Parthenon slightly differently, um, even though it's the same structure inherently. You know, they, this idea of order versus barbarism could also be interpreted as, you know, good versus evil. But again, how did the individual feel? Was it a matter of pride or, you know, to harken back? Was this like, you know, a fear of being that barbarian, of being evil, of being ungodly? You know, it's just one of those things I really want you to think about when you think about, you know, the idea of the palimpsest and the idea of architecture and what it has meant to certain groups of people over time. Again, the people who entered that building are just as important as the building itself when it comes to understanding it. And again, as I mentioned, parts of the architecture are on display in museums across the globe. And we're going to get into the issue of repatriation and specifically looking at the Elgin marbles, uh, which were pieces of the pediment, which was that triangular bit up at the top there. And we're also going to look at uh, tourism as well. All right, so uh, here are my sources for this week, um, as well as a picture from when I had the privilege of visiting the Acropolis. Uh, everything about the Acropolis itself is very impressive, I must say, the view and everything like that, but the Parthenon was something altogether special. It was massive, it was, you know, you couldn't see it just by, you know, looking at it. You had to kind of scan it. It was absolutely insane. 
But it was such a privilege to be able to see that in person and, you know, understand this idea of shock and awe and grandeur. It was a really incredible experience. All right, well, that concludes lecture four. Uh, remember, if you have any questions, to please reach out via Google Classroom and to check out the FAQ section in week zero. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at our final case study, the Hagia Sophia. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a really great rest of your day.